Thank you very much, Guido, and thanks to the ICGEB for the invitation to talk to you. I uh, hope you can hear me. If you can't, just tell me and I will shout louder. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some ideas to develop uh, some new vaccines. Uh, b before I do that, I must introduce you to the collaborations that are involved. So we work uh, here at Reading, which is a medium in the UK system. This is a medium-sized university situated between London and Oxford. Uh, we work with a structural biology group at the University of Oxford. And as it happens, quite close to Reading is the major government-funded uh, animal research institute in the UK, the Purbright Institute. And as, I, as you will see, I will talk about the development of some animal vaccines, and this work is done in collaboration with them. The influenza work I will talk about was done with a collaboration with a small company situated in Cambridge called Immunobiology. And we also have an industrial collaborator, Merck Animal Health, for the, uh, the animal vaccines I will talk about, the foot and mouth disease vaccines. In the UK, the people involved in the group are Sylvia, Claudine, and Hamanta working on foot and mouth disease development of vaccines, and the influenza work mainly done by Elena, but Sylvia also did a little bit of this work. And we also did a collaboration with Marina Boto at the uh, Imperial College London. So just to begin with, a few general ideas about vaccines. As you know, we all are getting older. It's a tremendous success story, the health of the, the population. It happens across the world, although it's most obvious, of course, in the Western Hemisphere. And there are, f in my view, there are four great pillars of scientific advancement which have allowed this longevity, sanitation, nutrition, antibiotics, and the development of vaccines. And it is strange to me, and I think it's also strange to many of you, that we live in a time when, despite of this success, we have people who speak against vaccines and cause problems. You have this uh, in Italy with large outbreaks of measles recently, you might think that it is a problem only for you. It is not. We have it in the UK as well. Just a couple of years ago, we had over a 1,000 cases of measles, and we still have measles circulating in the, uh, the inner cities, despite the fact we have a perfectly good vaccine against measles. Uh, one thing perhaps you don't know is that you've just made the announcement in Italy of vaccinating all children before they go to school as a requirement, as they do in fact in the United States. In most states, in the UK, all vaccines are still not compulsory. They are only voluntary. They're advised, but you can, not, you can hold back a vaccine from your child if you feel strongly for it, uh, which is a crazy situation. Part of the reason, in my view, is that vaccines can give rise to so-called scare stories. They are all wrong, but nevertheless, they derive from the fact that when a vaccine is given, at least a traditional vaccine, it is frequently the case that it will induce quite an inflammatory response. This is particularly true, of course, for the live vaccines. Now, you know, and I know, that actually this is a very good thing to get this inflammation recruits the immune system to the site of the infection and generates a very robust immune response. Nevertheless, it's the sort of thing that gives rise to the scare stories in vaccines. And generally speaking, going forward, I think it's something that we should try to avoid. So in my view, uh, we have a, a, a challenge in the development of new vaccines. Of course, they have to work. They have to produce neutralizing antibody. We have to know the basis of how to generate that. But we should try to do it with something that is immunogenic and gives rise to long-lasting immunity, but doesn't necessarily give this obvious inflammation, which can give rise to these, these, these crazy stories. So um, if we think about the mechanisms by which this inflammatory response occurs, it is maybe the case that we can use some of these mechanisms in the design of new vaccines so that we don't have a generally inflammatory response, but we do get good uptake and processing of the antigens that we make. And the two areas I introduce you to for the work that I will describe are this, which is the, the role of 
oligomeric structures, or VLPs in the case of viruses, virus particles, VLPs, multiple oligomeric proteins, as opposed to a monomeric protein in the generation of a good immune response. And the basis of this is shown on this slide, where if you look, you can see that the B cell receptor gets cross-linked in the case of an oligomeric array. It's capable of cross-linking the receptor to give rise to strong signaling in the B cell so it can go off and development and be develop and become eventually uh, the plasma cell that will give high affinity antibodies. But if you give a monomeric protein, even though it's the same protein, that cross-linking is not possible. So an oligomeric array, something like the virus particle, is much better than a single purified protein and certainly much better than a peptide. The second uh, mechanism that I'll introduce you to, which I'm sure you, all you students know about, is the presentation of antigens in antigen-presenting cells. So the key thing about this cell type, as you will remember, is that it's fully loaded. This is the Lamborghini of the, uh, of the antigen processing cells. It has all the toll receptors, it has uh, cytosolic receptors, and importantly, it can load antigens after processing into both MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 uh, presentation proteins so that it can induce both T cells and B cell responses, sometimes called cross-presentation. So if you can get things into APCs, you're on a, a, a winning course to produce a good uh, immunity. And one of the ways that antigens get into here is through the formation of antigen-antibody complexes, and then via the interaction of the FC domain with the FC receptor, CD64, you get uptake into this cell, chopping up of the protein into the relevant peptides, and then presentation of the peptides in MHC. So I ask you to remember these two basic mechanisms, oligomeric arrays, and targeting into antigen-presenting cells. And the two examples I will give you of a recombinant approach to the production of new vaccines which tries to make use of these immune processing pathways are the development of coronavirus VLPs, virus-like particles, in particularly, uh, particularly for foot and mouth disease virus. And the second, um, targeting APCs, I will give you an example for the development of influenza vaccines. So you might think uh, putting these two viruses and vaccines together is crazy. I mean, they're completely different. One is an animal virus, the other one largely a human pathogen that we worry about anyway. Uh, one of them is, is a split antigen, one of them is a whole killed, killed virus, but in fact they have things that are uh, in common. So both of them fall into this area of virology dealing with emerging and re-emerging infections, constant changing of strains which quickly replace the vaccine strain and are a challenge to immunize against because the virus is moving so quickly. There are multiple serotypes in all cases, so you either have to think about a vaccine that will cover everything or you have to make multiple vaccines, and multiple vaccines difficult to do, so at least you have to make them very quickly and very easily. In the case of foot and mouth disease, this is a category 3 pathogen, so you have to have very expensive facilities even to produce the virus in the first place. There's some idea that in both of these cases you should stockpile vaccines so that you can roll them out when there is an epidemic situation. But if you do want to stockpile vaccines, then really they have to be very stable. Otherwise you put them in the freezer and when you come back six months later, actually they don't work so well. Happily, in both of these cases, influenza and foot and mouth, there are experiments in the literature which suggest that you could do this via a recombinant route. It's possible to think about recombinant vaccines. As I mentioned, they are different. One is an envelope versus a capsid virus. One is a subunit versus whole virus. The foot and mouth is the whole. Flu, generally speaking, is a subunit, not always. Animal versus human, so we have a situation of maybe we have to think about how quality control 
uh, is important here. The human may be more so than the animal, although if you haven't worked in the development of animal viruses, I can tell you that actually the regulations are almost as strict as the development of human viruses. However, one of the factors that is important is that if you want to develop an animal virus, it has to be cheap, an animal vaccine. Uh, farmers do not like to pay a lot of money, even if it protects their, their animal. The method we use to produce the recombinant proteins that I'll talk about is uh, recombinant bacular virus expression. We've been doing this for many years. We've even published some of the technology involved. Um, I think most of you know what it is. It's like most recombinant viral systems. You transfer the gene of interest into the virus background. These days, this selection process is 100% successful. You do not get wild-type virus. You only get the recombinant. And if you check in the cells for the production of the recombinant protein, you can find it filling the cytoplasm of the infected cell. So it's a very productive system, and it's quite quick uh, to use. You may also know that it's used now commercially to develop uh, recombinant vaccines. So probably the most uh, well-known example is the Cervarix, the HPV vaccine, uh, produced by Glaxo. Uh, the Merck vaccine is produced in yeast, but the Glaxo one is produced in insect cells. But actually, there are a number of vaccines on the market for the animal uh, vaccination area, and these two are produced by recombinant baculovirus production. So. The key point is it's been through all the administrative processes that are required to release a vaccine, and also the productivity is enough to make these vaccines cheap enough to actually produce at the end of the day, which is an important consideration. So for the first uh, data that I'll show, I'll concentrate on the development of a recombinant vaccine for foot and mouth disease virus which, as I mentioned, is a Category 3 virus, so it's difficult to grow. There are many serotypes that occur across the world, and there's a constant need to keep moving as the virus evolves. So it's a classic case of where recombinant technology could offer a solution if it could be made to work. In theory, it's quite easy. We should just make the empty capsid shell. This is the icosahedral shell of the, of the virus. You find this across virology in many uh, virus examples. It's a very robust structure, so it's used by evolution very frequently. It can be adapted to many niches. We have viruses which pass through stomach acid and remain stable. We have viruses that are very unstable in acid and will infect very, very quickly. There's a whole range of different uh, icosahedral type structures. And what we know is that this structure derives from a single precursor protein called the P1 protein, which is cleaved by a viral enzyme called the, the 3C protease. So knowing this information, you should imagine that very quickly all we need to do is to take the P1, produce the 3C, the 3C will cut the P1 up, into the final proteins, and the final proteins will assemble into a virus particle. Remember, for virology, lots of self-assembly involved, because viruses simply don't have the genetic capacity very often to encode a complicated assembly pathway. They generally, if you get things, right concentration in the right place, the particle will form. So we did this, um, straightforward molecular engineering. And the first surprise in this area was that uh, it didn't work. So here we have the production of the P1 protein, the precursor. So that's 100,000 molecular weight. And you can see we can detect it very nicely by Western blot. But when we added the 3C protease to the end of it, we just make an extra protein with the 3C added at the end, we got absolutely no expression at all. Now, if you over expose this western blot. In fact, you do see a little bit of processing, but basically the productivity of the system is gone. Uh, we wondered about why this might be, and we found uh, in the literature that there were a number of cases where the protease had been described as being cytotoxic. 
Now, there are good reasons for this in the field of virology. It's part of the way that the virus closes down the host cell so that it can produce only its own proteins. Nevertheless, if you're trying to produce it in a recombinant route, this is a problem. The other thing uh, to think about is that, in fact, the coronaviruses infect very quickly. Um, the cells are dead within eight hours, com complete cell lysis, generally speaking. But if we're trying to produce a recombinant product, we're really trying to produce it over several days of, peer of, of expression. And so if there is any cytotoxicity from this protein, it can be a problem in this long-term incubation where it's not a problem in the short-term incubation. So we looked at ways to improve this, and the solution that we came up with was to downregulate the amount of the 3C protease that is produced. So here we have some constructs that, for example, include a, a frame shift signal. A frame shift signal is used by viruses to reduce the translation of the protein after the frame compared to the protein before the frame. So here we're just reducing the amount of 3C altogether. And we also took advantage of the fact that the 3C had been crystallized and we knew that there were certain residues that we could mutate which would reduce the activity of the 3C enzyme itself. So we have two factors, less 3C and also a less active 3C. And when we added these to the P1 in the same type of construct, you can see whereas before we lost expression, now we get stoichiometric conversion of P1 to the final cleaved product, VP1, and VP2 and VP0, uh, VP3 and VP0, which are also there, but this antibody doesn't detect them. And these cells should be now making the mature proteins which will assemble into an empty capsid particle. So to look for these, uh, we did some confocal microscopy. So this is super resolution confocal microscopy. And you're looking at the difference between the expression of P1 on its own in an insect cell delivered by a baculovirus recombinant. And here is the same construct, but has the reduced 3C attached to the end. And what you can see is that the P1 precursor protein occurs throughout the cytoplasm in this rather granular, maybe slightly precipitated form. But when we add the 3C, this completely redistributes into these individual dots. And in fact, the size of these dots is consistent, along with the antibody and the fluorescent label, to be individual picornavirus particles or clusters of, p of picornavirus particles. If we take a look by EM through the expressing cells, if we look in the nucleus of the expressing cell, we see excellent examples of the baculovirus, which is being used as the vector here. Baculovirus is a big DNA virus. Sometimes uh, you slice it long ways and you see it sideways and sometimes you slice it across the top so you see the, the different the nuclear capsids in the middle. But if you look in the cytoplasm you can now see the plasma membrane examples of the picornaviruses assembling throughout the cytosol of the infected cell just as you saw in the super resolution image. Now, for those of you who are working in virology, it's just worth a, a, a small mention here that normally speaking, these types of viruses, so called positive strand viruses, produce lots of membrane structure, which, which is where virus replication and assembly <coughs> occurs. So, actually, you're seeing something that never normally exists in nature here. The virus is assembling throughout the cytoplasm not in a particular location in the infected cell, which is normally where it is found, which suggests that actually host factor involvement is probably very little, and actually if you get the concentrations of protein right, it should work for every serotype. If we break these cells open and purify them, uh, we get very nice examples of picornavirus structures. And what you can see here is that the stain used in the electron micrographs, micrographs has penetrated the particle, uh, which tells you there's nothing inside. So these particles have no genome inside. They're completely non-infectious. They're made in a non-infectious way, so we can make them at P1. We don't need to be in a Category 3 lab. 
we can simply PCR the P1, the structural region from a circulating strain, make the recombinant, and in theory, produce the vaccine. We wanted to be sure that what we were making in this system really was only the foot and mouth disease, picornavirus, empty particle. And to do this, uh, we tagged the virus with the HIST tag, which are, many of you will know, a standard biochemical way of purifying recombinant proteins. This is the protomeric unit that is, builds up together to form that capsid array. Um, and it's known that there are loops on the outside of this structure which can be modified. They get modified naturally, for example, by antibody selection. So we inserted the HIST tag into one of these known loops. And of course, because this is an array, an icosahedral array, it will occur multiple times around the virus particle. We checked the expression of this recombinant, and here are some Western blots which just show that we're making the right thing. Um, so here are the extracts from the expressing cells, some washes of the His column, and then finally the elution of the His column. And what you can see is that the material that's present in the lysate can be purified via the His tag so that in the end it's detected by an anti-FNDV antibody. <coughs> Baculovirus material is largely present in the supernatant but is not purified. The same material that binds the anti-FMDV antibody also binds an anti-HIS antibody. And if you stay in the gel, you see that you go from this multiple bands which are present in the lysed insect cells through to only now three bands which you find in the purified fraction. And if we take a look at that in slightly bigger magnification, you can see individual bands in the lysate which disappear when you pass them through the IMAC column, when you purify based on the, on the HIST tag. So if we take these individual bands and we send them for mass spec, we can determine exactly what they're made of. And it turns out that the top one is made of the VP0, which is one of the mature proteins required for assembly. The second band is made of VP1, which is the other protein required. And in fact, the third band is mostly made of this protein, VP3, which occurs in the middle of the precursor. But we also find some signal from a protein called VP2, which suggests that a little bit of so-called processing is happening with these proteins. It's normally considered that this processing only occurs when RNA is incorporated into picornavirus particles. That clearly is not true. In some serotypes, we observe natural cleavage of the VP0 precursor into the VP2 plus VP4 final uh, proteins. Um, we don't quite know why that occurs, uh, but clearly, RNA is not the only trigger factor, which is new information that we didn't expect to find on work that was predominantly to do with the production of the vaccine. So we conclude that we're making authentic empty capsids, but in some cases, they're in various stays, stages of maturation. The last thing I want to introduce you to before showing you some of the immun immunology trials is the idea that if you're in a recombinant background, you can do all types of engineering of the sequence that you could never do in the virus particle. For those of you who are not in virology, you have to remember that when a virus is produced, it has to be in a so-called metastable state. It has to be stable enough to survive in the environment if I cough it to you, it has to be long enough lived to get across so that you can take it in. But also, as soon as it contacts the right cell and finds the receptor, it must be able to open. So it is in, always in a metastable state. And from a vaccine point of view, that instability is a problem. Because when you store it, the virus tends to slowly come to pieces. So maybe in engineering terms we could fix it so that it cannot come to pieces. 
if you did this for the virus, the virus would be dead. So you would never be able to grow it. But you can do it in a recombinant system. As it happens, the VP2 proteins in the final icosahedron lie together in this type of arrangement. And right at this interface, there is a critical histidine, which we know from the crystal structures lie very close together. So what we've done here is a trick which has, in fact, also been, been used here at ICGB, and that is we've mutated the histidine to a cysteine. And we can predict from the structure that these cysteines should be close enough to form a disulfide bond. So you remember the covalent bond, if it forms, is very strong, and this capsid will be extremely stable. So we produced this mutant and made the recombinant VLPs. And uh, we could purify enough for them to be crystallized. And our colleagues at Oxford solved the structure of, these, of both of these, the wild type and the mutated form. And there are two results shown on this structure. So the first result is if you look at the electron density of the yellow here, these are the histidines in the wild type version. This is the VP2 interface. But if you look at the blue electron density, this is the cysteine version. And you can see that now the density links together. So these cysteines have formed a disulfide bond, which previously was not present. The second result is if you just stand back for a minute from this slide and look at the density generally, you can see that the yellow density and the blue density are the same. So in other words, when you mutate to stabilize this capsid, you do not alter the structure overall, which means it is still going to be a perfectly good vaccine candidate. So since our objective in this work is to make a recombinant vaccine, we have to test it. So we did this uh, with our colleagues in Purbright, uh, who immunized cattle with uh, test VLPs produced. Um, and we took a look at the sera that are produced by the immunized animals. <clears throat> now, what you little bit of information you need to know from me is that the basis of the coronavirus entry, or FMD entry, I should say, into the cell is the interaction of the virus with this integrin receptor. And that interaction occurs via a loop on the surface of the virus particle which is characterized by the presence of this critical tripeptide, RGD. So if you want to stop virus entry, you need to make antibodies that will prevent this interaction, the classic way that vaccines work. Neutralizing antibodies prevent virus interaction with the receptor. And those antibodies should bind to this RGD peptide. So if we take the sera, and take a look at where they bind using a peptide array system, uh, we can have a look. Um, there's a little bit of reaction in the VP2 region. There's a little bit of reaction in the VP3 region, but the predominant interaction is in VP1, which is where that loop occurs. And you can see if we look at these overlapping peptides on the array, you can see that the central feature that's recognized in all of them is RGD. In other words, these sera are produced as if we had immunized with the virus, except that we've now immunized with a safe and easy pr to produce uh, virus-like particle. And in fact, uh, these cattle were challenged in P3 facilities at Purbright. And these are the quantitative PCRs, which look at virus infection. These are the control animals. You can see the infection takes off. The only reason it comes down here is the animals were culled because they were fully, uh, they had full disease. And in the two immunizations that we did with the wild type capsids or the stabilized capsids, you can see we get a transient RT PCR signal, which is just the challenge virus coming into the animal, but then it quickly goes away. And in fact, none of these animals showed any clinical signs of foot and mouth disease virus. So it it's a good result. These VLPs can work as successful vaccines. So you might wonder why I'm still working in academia. Why am I not with a Lamborghini somewhere? Well, uh, the reason is that actually, although it works in some serotypes extremely well, 
it doesn't seem to work exactly the same in all serotypes. And I'll just leave you with a little bit of data to show you the differences that occur. So, for example, the example I showed you is a so-called A serotype, in fact, a, a virus originally from Iraq, uh, which uh, causes outbreaks still around the world. And we produced VLPs for this, <coughs> and those VLPs are the ones I showed you, and they protect the animals. And they show that processing that I indicated to you was a slightly novel discovery. However, um, the O serotype is one that's prevalent in many emerging parts of the world. Um, and we've done the same thing with the O serotypes. And we produce the protein, we produce cleavage, we get the maturation. However, the particles do not seem to behave in exactly the same way. When we band them on a sucrose gradient, in this case, we get a very tight banding of VLPs in the middle of the gradient. Whereas in this case, we seem to get a spread of antigen throughout the gradient, as if there are aggregation problems. In addition, in this case, we do not see the processing of EP0, whereas in this case, we do. So we're not quite sure whether this processing is part of a good VLP. And this is an area that we continue to work on. The second area is the stabilization area that I, I described to you with the addition of the cysteine bond. If you look at the different serotype sequences, it turns out that you cannot make that cysteine bond in all of them. There isn't the possibility to do it. So you have to look at other uh, ways to stabilize the particle. And we've now investigated perhaps 50 different mutants. Unfortunately, there's no screening system. Everyone has to be made singly or in combination. Then we have to make the VLPs. Then we have to test their stability. And here's an example of something that we find. So when you first look at this electron micrograph, you think, hey, that's really great. You've got particles everywhere. They look wonderful. They've got a hole in the middle. And that's all true, except if you look at the scale bar. And if you look at the scale bar, you'll see that these are too small. These should be about 30 nanometers, 27 nanometers. They're actually about 11. Actually, these particles are a thing called the pentama. They are the assembly intermediate. So A to B to final particle. These are the B form. They're so stable. We've added mutations to make them so stable. They don't bother to assemble any further. They're quite happy to stay in this form. But as a vaccine, it's not such a good idea. We want the full icosahedral array to get that B cell activation that I described to you. So we continue to work on these mutations. And as I said, it's a slow process because we must test them individually one at a time. So if I just conclude this first part on the, uh, the picornavirus VLPs, um, I showed you that it's a quite a complex system. We take a, a precursor, which is cleaved into multiple mature proteins, and they assemble to give us the virus structure. That required a biochemical trick of downregulation of 3C in order to be efficient. But when we did that, we did get capsids. They're immunogenic, and they seem to be structurally identical to the normal virus. So they should be good vaccines. We've shown that you can modify these in some ways. You can tag them for purification or you can stabilize them. So you should be able to make a vaccine which is better than the authentic vaccine. And of course, this technology, if it works, should apply to a number of other picornaviruses as well. So I want to move now to the second example of uh, trying to exploit natural antigen processing. And the example I'll give you this time is influenza. Um, so you all know this, seasonal infection uh, originating in birds, but uh, now transmitted into a number of mammal species, horses and humans, uh, circulates on its own in humans, and we forever have the problem that it could emerge from the avian reservoir to give a new virus. So we have a, a drift situation, regular changes from year to year, and we have a pandemic, a shift situation, which happens perhaps once every 10 to 20 years. There are many of these strains, but at least thankfully for, uh, for the human vaccine story, 
Um, there are largely only three, H1, H2, and H3. H2 is effectively extinct at the moment. But we worry about all these others, which are found in the bird species, getting back into the human population. And one of the ways out of this in terms of vaccines is not to worry about catching the virus when it emerges, but to actually produce all these hemagglutinins by themselves and have them already stockpiled, ready, so that even if a new virus emerged, you would have the necessary hemagglutinin protein, which provides, <coughs> I should have said, is the protein that provides the neutralizing immunity to the virus. Here it is, complex structure, one of the first viral glycoproteins to have its structure determined. The protein binds to the receptor at the top here, this receptor binding domain, but notice that it's a trimeric molecule, three molecules together, and the trimer is held together by this stem region, this, this so-called second part, HA2 domain. So we have the critical domain for immunology and the critical domain for assembly. We've been interested to just take this whole protein and attach it to a molecule that might improve its immunogenicity. And the molecule that we use is the crystallizable fragment of human IgG. So you remember basically the antibody can be divided by a line through the middle here. You have these domains which are involved in antigen recognition, so they lock on to the target. And then you have the domain which is going to tell the immune system to do something. It, hey, I've, I've caught something, now I need to trigger some responses. And we thought that, well, maybe if you just take this domain and add it directly to the antigen, you could stimulate what would normally happen in an immune reaction. So if we just, in a normal immunity situation, the antigen is captured by antibodies to form this antibody-antigen complex. And this complex will be then taken up and processed in antigen-presenting cells. But of course, you could just bypass this by connecting the FC directly to the antigen. And you should be able to get the same type of thing to occur. So the idea is to make hemagglutinin fuse to the FC domain. This will assemble, perhaps, into some oligomeric forms. I'll show you these later. And that these should directly go into the antigen processing cell and quickly generate the immunity that you want. And you could do that for every hemagglutinin. So it seems a reasonable idea. So again, we use recombinant bacular viruses for this. And uh, we have a simple system where we use a, a signal peptide which derives from a bacular virus protein so that it works very well in insect cells. And we slot in the hemagglutinin into a vector which uh, picks up the human IgFC domain. We actually have another vector which replaces this. And the reason to do this is that you can then make the same hemagglutinin without the Ig tag. And that's a very useful way to look for antibodies which are specific to the hemagglutinin. You just make a different source of it, that's all. So the outcome, if we use these vectors, should be that we generate soluble FC-fused hemagglutinin, which is our candidate vaccine. And we also make some HA protein in insect cells, which is not FC tagged. And these are very useful for detecting seroconversion without having to grow the virus. Um, so in fact, this works very well. Uh, we get very nice production of uh, fusion proteins, which can be purified easily. Here's an example. So here is the test material. Here it is passed through um, a purification column. And here is the elution of the purification column. And you can see that we have massive signal in the starting supernatants. It's reduced when it goes through the column, but then it comes back when we elute it. So we can get nice purified hemagglutinin. If we check the molecular weight of this on gradients, um, the basic molecular weight of the molecule is about 120,000. But actually, on gradients, it migrates much bigger than this. And so, let me just go back. Yeah. So we are at least making a dimer. And in fact, we think we're probably making something much bigger. And that is because we have linkage via the FC domain, but we also have linkage 
via the HA2 domain of the hemagglutinin. So we have these, this quite large protein aggregate, which is probably um, useful for antibody generation. Um, it's important if you make recombinant proteins to know that they're functional. They need to be folded correctly. Folding is the critical thing. Um, and we've done this by just testing whether these proteins bind to the right receptors. So some of you may know that the avian virus binds to a different set of receptors to the human virus. And we can check this with the purified hemagglutinins made from those different viruses. So, for example, here are some airway epithelial cells uh, which are stained for the presence of the different receptors, the different sialic acids for influenza. And the human types bind to non-ciliated cells, whereas the avian types bind to ciliated cells, which is exactly what you find with the, the, different, um, the different form of the receptors. And as you can see with these recombinant stainings, uh, the binding that we see is exactly as predicted from the tropism of the virus. So the human purified HA binds to non-ciliated cells, whereas the avian purified HA binds to ciliated cells. Now, if we go on and use these as uh, test vaccines, they work very well. And we do not add any adjuvant. So the FC domain here is providing the adjuvant function nice purified soluble protein, no Freund's adjuvant, no alhydrogel. You just immunize the animal and you get very nice responses. And you can see that the responses that you get are largely serotype specific. So if you immunize with an H1, you react with an H1. If you immunize with an H3, you react with an H3. And if you immunize with an H5, Interestingly, you react with H5 well, but you also react a little bit with H1. And that's because uh, there is a connection between the current hemagglutinin 5, which is present on the current avian virus that people worry about, and the ancient H1 that occurred in the 1918 epidemic, which also came directly from birds. And this, this interaction you can see by a related reactivity. Um, we checked what type of antibody was made in these immunized animals, um, and it was the right profile. It's largely IgG1 with a little bit of IgG uh, 2A, and this is the classic result for a recombinant hemagglutinin-based flu vaccine. And so we were quite happy that these were good sources of candidate vaccines. And we went on and mapped where these antibodies bound, again by peptide array, and uh, you can see we get particular interactions with particular peptides. And when you look at where those peptides are in the folded structure, they surround the receptor binding pocket. And this is exactly where antibodies that are neutralizing would bind. We also did neutralizing assays in, with using pseudotype viruses and these sera are neutralizing. So it seems OK. However, what we've been interested in the last couple of years is exactly what mechanism is working here. I suggested to you that the mechanism was binding to the FC receptor on antigen presenting cells so that the protein is processed efficiently. And we decided that we should test that. Is that really the mechanism that's involved? And to do that, uh, the literature describes some mutations in the FC domain which mutate two leucine residues. And when you mutate these leucine residues, binding to the FC receptor is reduced by 100 times. So basically, you can abolish interacting with the receptor by introducing these two mutations. So we did this. Um, we mutated the FC so that it should not bind to the FC receptor. The other thing we did was, remember I told you that the immunology for hemagglutinin is all to do with that top head domain, not so much to do with the stem. And so we thought, well, you could make a simpler vaccine. You could make it easier, make it perhaps more productive by using just the HA1 domain, not the whole hemagglutinin, just the half that you need. So we made these constructs as well. So schematically, what we have is we have 
the full hemagglutinin fused to FC, which, as I've shown you, probably bonds into quite a large oligomer, sigma, eightma, something like that. And we have the HA1 domain. And now that it doesn't have the second domain, there's no interaction between the hemagglutinin sequences. There's only the interaction between the FC. So this should be only a dimeric molecule. So not only is it shorter, you do change its form in solution as well. And we made all of these in the presence or absence of this mutation that should knock out the FC binding. So if we check these after purification on gradients, you've seen the top one before. So this is the HA0 type material, and it bands in the middle of the gradient, which indicates it's a large molecule. It's a large array. But the HA1-based molecule, despite still having the FC tag, is a much smaller protein, consistent with only being a dimer. So we have these two different forms. So we went ahead and immunized with this. And um, when we immunized with the HA0 version, that's the full molecule, which gives the big oligomeric array, we were surprised to find that when you did this, including mutations that should abolish binding to the FC receptor, we still got very robust responses in the immunized animals. In fact, there was no change. So that mechanism, if it's there, is certainly not operating with these molecules. Or if it is, it's part of something else. But then when we checked the binding with the HA1 domains, now we see that if we introduce the FC mutations, which stop binding to the receptor, the, the immune response drops substantially. So this is going in via the FCR. And when you knock out the FCR binding, immunity is lost. So the question is, what's going on? I mean, they're almost the same molecule. Just a short piece of the hemagglutinin is different. Um, and the answer is um, that what these proteins do is recruit complements. So complement, you remember, is the very early phase of the innate immune system. It's sitting there in your plasma, waiting to be activated. Absolutely no specificity, but very fast to, to, to act. And in fact, uh, the first step of this is the aggregation of this protein, C1Q. And it does so via congregation of the FC domain. So if you have a cluster of FC domains, you activate C1Q. And if you, FC domains are left apart on individual antibodies, not an antigen antibody complex, then you do not trigger the pathway. And C1Q itself and one of the final products of the complement cascade are known to be adjuvants. They're adjuvants in situ, if you like. So we assumed that complement activation was part of this immunology story. And we tested this by doing the immunizations that I just described to you again. But we used a C1Q knockout mouse produced by Marina Boto at uh, the Imperial, Imperial College London. And you can now see that when we do these immunizations using the one that did not show any effect before with the VA mutants, actually we now get a substantial effect if the mouse is wild type or is C1Q knockout. It looks exactly like the result we got with just the HA1 domain. In other words, there is a role for complement C1Q in this full-length molecule, which forms the large oligomeric array. If we do the same experiment with the HA1 only, even though it's fused to the FC, the difference between these models now is very little. And the reason it's very little is because the complement has been, is not working anyway for this. This is only going in via the FC receptor. So the outcome of this work is that we think there are at least two different mechanisms of antigen processing. They're certainly going into APCs. It's a very useful way of producing soluble protein as a candidate vaccine. We originally thought we were only contacting the FC receptor, but that is not true. We are triggering complement with these large oligomeric structures. Complement is opsonizing the protein so it gets taken up for phagocytosis. It's also binding to this 
C1Q receptor, and it's also binding to FCR. So if it's a large array, like an antibody antigen complex, it's going in via all these mechanisms, which is what you want. Whereas if it's only a dimer, it's only going in via the FCR. So to conclude that, um, I've shown you that the addition of the FC domain to these candidate hemagglutinin proteins does stimulate immunity. And in, in fact, it's, it's amazing that it works as well without adjuvants. If any of you have tried heavily glycosylated proteins that are soluble with no adjuvant, you will know that the general rule is you get very little antibody at all, but they work very well. We think the stimulation is the result of at least two components, complement activation and the binding to the FCR. It's the oligomeric structure, again, that's important, not for that B cell contact in this case, but for triggering complement activation. There is FCR binding, but uh, it seems that the complement component is much bigger. And I think the critical thing here is whether or not these are actually ever used as vaccines. The principles that it show could be used to improve other subunit vaccines to give you that immun immunogenicity without necessarily giving you general information. So at the end of the introduction, I s suggested to you that the, uh, the challenge was to make these more targeted vaccines going forward, make them faster, make them easier, and make them cheaper. Um, and it, it seems to me from this data, and of course we're not the only people to do this type of work, you'll find other examples in the literature, but oligomeric assemblies like VLPs and targeting of APCs, particularly through natural ligands, um, I think may have a role to play. Um, I've finished, and um, I thank you very much for your attention.